sometimes it was an effort. I wouldn't ever say it was difficult. Um, it was just reminding myself, like I, I, when I quit smoking, okay, I have all these problems. I quit smoking millions of years ago. I just reframed my idea about myself as a non-smoker. I just said, okay, now I'm a non-smoker. I kind of tried to do the same thing with alcohol. Oh yeah, that's right, I'm a non-drinker. Um, and, and the thought would kind of go away, the habit nagging at me would kind of go away. I don't do that anymore. Welcome everybody. It's Katie with Thrive Alcohol Recovery. And today I have a guest with me. I have Tracy with me, who is a Sinclair Method success story and is coming on to share about her personal Sinclair Method experience. So I, I love doing these interviews, Tracy, because I hear from people all of the time how much they love to hear these success stories because there's many diverse experiences out there. So I just want to start by thanking you so much for taking time to chat with me today. Thanks. Glad to be here. Awesome. So let's just dive into it. I like to start at the beginning, just so people can have a sense of who you are and what, you know, what your drinking was like, you know, leading up to the Sinclair method and, and the years prior that you were drinking and really what led you to TSM. So would you be willing to share us, share with us a bit about your drinking history before TSM? Sure. So um, I had my first started drinking a little bit at about the age of 13. So I have a long history of <laughs> that. I'm 66. So that's quite a lot of time. Um, and that was experimenting. And uh, every once in a while, I would drink a little bit now and then. And it increased a little bit more through high school on the weekends and then through college um, a lot more. In fact, I think I experienced my first blackout in college. And that was really an unsettling experience. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Um, and then I met my husband and inherited uh, him and two children and uh, almost stopped drinking completely. I, we were, I was too busy. And I, so that was kind of cool for about five years. And then as they got older, I slowly started picking it back up again. And it naturally increased over time. And I, you know, like a lot of people, it got worse during COVID. Um, I was isolated at home, working from home and suddenly realized, oh, I could have my first glass of wine at four o'clock. <laughs> How handy is that? <laughs> and, you know, and then it actually started to get to be a little bit earlier than that. And that's when I really started drinking every day. And um, a bottle of wine a day was my average at that point. And it didn't take me very long after that to realize that I was really starting to have a problem. And, you know, how long am I going to do this? Um, I can't see myself as a 70 year old drinking a bottle of wine a, a day. So I um, started sort of researching and I knew I had heard of something that started with now. So that was my search now plus alcohol and found the Sinclair method and um, and th and your, your organization, TSM read the book, saw the video and thought, wow, this may really be something that might might work for me because just cold turkey quitting wasn't going, I know wouldn't work for me. And I know myself well enough to know that a 12 step program was not gonna work for me. So that was, I was so happy to stumble across all of this. I, I feel the same way to be honest, like it changed yeah. my life. And so, yeah. You know, I'm curious, you talking about it getting worse in COVID, like, man, I've heard that from so many yep. people. And just like you said, okay, I can start at four and then maybe three and then lunch hour. It just, it, yeah, so many people can relate with that. So was it starting to escalate before COVID and that just kind of tipped it over? Or what was it like leading up to that? A little bit more. So I was reaching a peak, like I thought I was at the peak before COVID, but it continued up and um, yeah, I was recognizing it. And what were some signs? Like, I know you said you were drinking, you know, around a bottle of wine. I don't know if that was more or less depending on the day, but just what were some things you were noticing where you were like, okay, this is becoming problematic. Yeah, I would, I'd notice that um, I wouldn't remember conversations that I'd had with my family or friends, um, either at a party or just because I'd had a few, three glasses of wine. I was definitely not present with anyone that, that I mean, was really a big, um, um, aha moment for me was like, I'm not even there when I'm, when I have alcohol in my system. And then sometimes blackouts or, you know, chunks of blackout. Uh, my husband and I watched a show and then the next day I'd say, Hey, let's watch this show. And he's like, we watched that last night. 
so that was a th those are some pretty good signs for me yep. yep yeah i relate with a lot of those and i think <laughs> many people watching do as well um wow okay so you kind of learned about the sinclair method somehow and did your research when you first learned about the protocol and had an understanding of it did it seem like it was too good to be true or were you confident in the science what were your first thoughts about it no, it just seemed like a miracle it seemed too good to be true and so what was really helpful was all the the people posting on your site on your page you know and the people posting on the tsm page about it takes a while you know this is it, hang in there and um it's you know it'll happen over time because you know initially it it, it wasn't a big change for me i did drop about 10 to 15 percent in my alcohol consumption and i did track it daily um so i got about a couple months into it and thought okay i'm one of those people i'm a non-responder this is never going to work for me um and and just so i would come to some of the meetings and hear people talk and i'd ask questions or i'd I'd read people's posts and that really helped me stick with it. Um, and I just, after I had sunk, you know, six months into it, I thought, well, I can't stop now. And I got so used to having the NAL in my system that I just, that's just how I drank then. It was always with NAL in my system. So it started to become pretty automatic um, for me. Uh, so yeah, it was like, okay, I hope this happens pretty soon because it just seems too easy yeah. to do it this way. And so many people understand and have that experience where they feel like, oh, I'm going to be part of the 20 some percent that it doesn't work <laughs> for. It's, I think everyone has that fear because we want it to work so badly and the results of this treatment are not instantaneous for most of us. So of course, discouragement can come about. So it's good to know that, you know, you have that experience and you're certainly not alone in that. I hope people listening will recognize that as well. So I wanted to quickly understand, you know, when you started the method, can you paint a picture for us what like a week in the life looked like or a day in the life of your drinking, just so people understand where you were at with your drinking when you started the treatment? So where I was and then uh, beforehand and then after I started the treatment? Yeah, like wh where, how, what your drinking patterns were before, like right before you started TSM. So this isn't... So, I hate to say this out loud, but I was starting to get to where I would probably have a glass of wine around noon. Um, at this point, I was retired. I, I'm retired now, and my husband was working. So I was home alone. Um, and I would, but, but still, even if I started at 12 or if I started at five, I would still drink a bottle of wine. It just kind of contracted and expanded to fit, fit the time I had. Um, so, when I started the, the TSM, one of the things obviously that happened was I became very aware of my alcohol consumption because I was logging it. You know, I'd log when I took the now, when I had my first drink, how many drinks I had, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And I started to be able to push back the start time, thank goodness, you know, to more around five o'clock um, as I progressed through the process. So I would just... Um, take my now and then especially if I started kind of early I would set a timer on my watch for five hours so that if I had to redose I'd have an hour overlap um, for that six hour time period and I would I would take another one then after five hours if I was going longer and again I just I just had that commitment just I will not take a drop of alcohol you know without the now in my system and in fact, there were a couple cases, um, usually if I was out of my ordinary routine, like we were up in Truckee visiting friends and we're going to lunch. Yay. I sit down at lunch and everybody orders a cocktail and I, oh, damn it, I didn't take my now. And so I'd sneak one and then just sit there and I, the glass, I'd order a glass and I'd let it sit there for an hour. <laughs> Those are the most difficult times on the <laughs> method and you're just like, I'm just thirsty. I'm going to drink water yeah, for an hour. I'm thirsty for water. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good for you, though. Like making the compliance a non negotiable. Like, yeah. I feel like if someone can do that and they do nothing else, eventually the method is going to take hold. Yes, there's more to it than just the medicine, but that's the foundation. Without that, people will just tread water. So you never had issues with compliance. Is that right? No, I didn't. I made Good. sure that was non negotiable. 
Yeah. And so many of us drink during the day as well. And I often hear people say like you did like, oh, this is bad, but I was drinking earlier. But it's like, if only we knew how many people were doing that, we might realize like, oh, okay, it's, it, yes, it's not good, but you know, it's right. not, it's pretty common, I should say. Yeah. Um. So what was your first or first few like drinking sessions on naltrexone? Did you notice immediate changes or was it more subtle? What was that like for you? Yeah, I know. Well, I, t- I my the my doctor that prescribed the um, the now said now start out with twenty five milligrams. You know, I completely forgot. So I took fifty milligrams on an empty stomach, and holy, <laughs> it laid me out. I just thought this is the worst thing in the world. I can't. And then I remembered I had taken too much. So I, once I got to the next day, I don't think I drank that day because I was so sick. Was it From, nausea or what was it? You know what. It, it was in my head, a little bit of nausea, but you know what I really had was like my muscles. Oh, I had to stretch all the time because my muscles were not cramping, but sort of, I was this weirdest oh. feeling. It was like, definitely could feel the drug in my system. Um, so I went back to 25 and then, yeah, I think even right then the wine tasted different. And I hear a lot of people say that, and it still does. Doesn't doesn't taste as good, tasted a little bitter. Um, and, and I drank less kind of immediately. Uh, like I said, I, instead of five glasses, I think a, a bottle of wine was five glasses. So I'd have four. Um, and then, uh, you know, initially for the first few weeks and stuff. So that was my initial experience with naltrexone. Okay, good. So yeah, so the, there's a percentage of you rough. I think it's like roughly, we estimate like 15, 20% have like kind of more intense side effects in the beginning. And I, I know you've heard that before of people who take the full 50 for whatever reason. And they're like, Oh no, but it it sounds like after that you were able to take the lower dose and adjust and did the side effects go away? Yes. They went away after eh, two weeks. Okay, cool. You know, they weren't as ever as bad as that first day, but you know, kind of cranky feeling and uh, headache and yeah, that's good. Um, I know if someone takes it and they don't know what to expect and they think that's how it's going to be every time, yeah, every they're like, time. forget this. <laughs> but they do go away for most of us. That's the good news. Okay, so today, as I'm understanding, you've been on the method for about seven months. Is that right? Actually, I looked at it. Uh, it's been 10 now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I counted it up wrong. So I actually went back to my tracker and it's been 10 months. It's, I started in April of 23. Okay. Yeah. So what does that look like for you then? Like you noticed those early changes in the beginning. What was it like for you over the last 10 months? Were you seeing consistent drink reduction? Were you feeling discouraged? We know you were compliant, so that was handled. But what was the journey like the last 10 months? Um, So I I was impatient, um, as I think most people are. So nothing was happening fast enough. Um, But I, I had an initial drop off and then my chart just goes like this for basically eight months. And um, I, I, I know that there's more work to be done than just taking the pill and drinking. And so I would try to find motivation to, to, to have fewer drinks in the day and found that tough. And for me, it, it felt more like a habit issue than a craving issue necessarily. And so um, just as part of a regular um, physical, I had a CBC, a complete blood count test done. And one of the things they tested was my liver function and it was high, my bad stuff. So I saw that I got those test results and I just, that was it. I just quit drinking completely. Um, I wanted to get that taken care of right away. And it, it scared me because I've never had that show up before. And it was so easy to just quit completely. And it's because I had 10 months of naltrexone behind me. And I finally found my motivation there as well. And so I just stopped and, and I didn't have another drink for three, I think it was three weeks and felt like I had sort of gotten things under control and sort of give my liver a rest. And then I deliberately wanted to see if I could have a glass of wine and not go right back into the, um, old patterns. And so I had a glass of wine and, you know, I had a glass of wine and that was, I didn't want more and it was okay. And I didn't have another one again, I think for a week and a half. And then I had one again. Then I started experimenting with having some wine socially. 
So I think I was at a book club meeting or something and I had a glass. And so far, um, it's still like no big deal. In fact, usually the next day, I'm sorry I did it. I don't have a hangover, but I'm just like, ah, oh, I didn't need to, I didn't need to do that. So I'm thinking that, you know, I keep on the naltrexone every time I have one, decide I'm going to have a, a, a wine or a cocktail, I'll, I'll probably get there to where it's like you talk about how you just, just not drinking anymore. Yeah. It just becomes so uninteresting that it's, um, right. Preference not to drink. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you were on it for 10 months. It was, you saw that reduction, but it was definitely up and down and maybe you felt plateaued. Were you having yeah. alcohol-free days before you kind of yeah. took that? You were regular. Tell, few, tell us about a, that. Okay. Um, yeah. So I know that um, one of the things you're supposed to do is like plan something with a lot of endorphins on alcohol-free days and stuff. But I, I feel like I have pretty endorphin filled days anyway. Um, I got to tell you, being retired is the greatest thing in the entire world. <laughs> Don't so, rub it in. No, I'm just no I'm just, I earned it, man. <laughs> yeah, you earned it. I got some ways to go. <laughs> um, so I discovered pickleball and I would go out and play pickleball and met tons of new people and great made great friends and just would get exercise every day. So that's, I would do the same thing on, on my alcohol free days. Um, but I didn't really feel like I did anything very different on my alcohol-free days as I did on my consuming days. Um, I just had to plan it so I'd remember. Because um, like I said, it was sort of a habit thing. Um, now I have to remind myself that I am going to have a glass of wine because I, I forget to take the pill. And then if, if you don't take the pill, then you're not having a glass of wine. So I think it was the other night I was going to have a glass. Of, I had set a timer on my watch to remind me because I don't even think about it. And that's great too, because if I don't take it, then it's not even a question. Then it's like, nah, not having any. And you're not like, oh darn, like I wish it. It's just like, well, I guess it's not happening tonight. Guess, guess it's another alcohol free day. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that completely changed where you were going from having to plan those alcohol free days and now you have to plan the drinking yeah. day. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you spoke about the habit and there's so many people, that's what they feel. And they're very self-aware like you are, where it's like they feel naltrexone working, but it's just that default habitual routine we have with alcohol. That's almost like the easy choice, the comforting choice. It's familiar to us. And so I feel like in some ways that's the harder part of the method of like, okay, well, how else am I going to spend the five hours in the evening that I'm drinking wine and doing this and that? And right. so- but you, it's interesting. So you were on the method, you were seeing drink reduction, kind of working the method like we all do, but then you had that liver screen 10 months in and that scared you. So you were like, I'm going to take a break from alcohol. So tell us about that break. And like, was it hard? Were you craving? Were you wishing you could drink? What was that like for you? Yeah. So it was amazingly easy because I've quit before. I've quit. I've done dry January or dry October. I quit one time for three months just to see what it was like. And that was hard. It was sort of white knuckling, especially through the initial couple of weeks. This was just like, I just stopped. And it was also, I could have done this sooner, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, so no, it was, it was easy. There was a little bit of, I always had a glass of wine when I made dinner. So that, that association was, would come up, but then I would just remember that I wasn't drinking and, and carry on. Um, so I was really glad that I had those, I had like eight months of naltrexone under my belt before I, I made the, the decision to stop then. So yeah, it really, if I had gotten those liver function tests and not had the NAL, you know, and the TSM uh, you know, behind me, I think it would have really been challenging. Yeah. And like what you said earlier, it's like, you weren't like, you said something about like being challenged with like the motivation aspect. Like there was no urgency really to get this right. issue under control. You were drinking less on now and kind of working the protocol, but that liver screen scared you a bit, it sounds like, and it gave you a reason to take a break from alcohol. And so I think sometimes it's easy when we don't have any immediate urgency to, you know, make this change that can cause it to be prolonged and, you know, nothing yeah. really wrong with that. But for you, it's like that ign ignited your flame again. And then when you had the alcohol free time, you say it was 
easy. And I've heard that from so many people who I think psychologically were a bit terrified of the alcohol free days because we're like, what do we do? Like, and like what you do before that time. <laughs> yeah. And you said it was white knuckled before. So maybe we think, oh, it's going to be like that this time. But over and over again, I hear people say, actually, the alcohol free day was easier than I thought it would be. So that was true for you as well, it sounds yes, like. Definitely. Wow. So, um, you reintroduced alcohol again after that like few week break and you've been able to drink moderately and and that's where you're at today with the method. So just where are you at now? Like kind of like assessing your relationship with alcohol. It sounds like you want to maybe drink moderately and socially as the occasion arises and take it from there. Yeah. So I, my goal was never to become 100% abstinent. I have no problem if I do. That would be great. My I always wanted to be a normie you know, everybody else can do it <laughs> kind of a thing. My husband, he has a beer once a week, maybe, you know. Uh, so I'd always been sort of envious of people that had that mindset and, and were like that. So that that was, has been my goal. And I feel like I might be there if I continue with this and it turns out that it's, you know, it's kind of a hassle now because you got to think ahead, you got to take the pill, you know, it doesn't taste as good all of that, um, maybe I will end up not drinking anymore. And that would be perfectly fine with me. And I'd be very happy just to have a wine every now and then. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And that's like something that I think is hard for people to grasp, especially, I don't know about, maybe I'll ask this of you. When you were starting on the method, did the concept of like, you know, I'll be fine if I don't drink again, like where you're at today, was that something that seemed attainable to you? Or were you very focused on like, I'm not going to quit drinking? You know, I guess if your goals... Uh, evolved over time? Um, I, I, my goal has been the same. The uh, my, my belief that I'd be able to achieve it has increased as okay. I've moved forward. But yeah, my goal always was, yeah, this would be great if I could get it under control and fantastic if I didn't drink. So um, it's nice to see that I kind of have a choice. I could go either way, I feel like right now. Yeah, that's great. I know it's hard to when we've lacked control over alcohol for so long, it's hard to imagine what we'd be like, like you said, being a normie. And when we get there, it's like, it's really, it's really cool. Yeah. And it's, I, I wondered, like I joke, but I did wonder what I was going to do if I didn't drink, what was I going to do with myself and, and my time? And it's just the same. You just don't have, you don't have a drink here with you, at least for me, it's the same. I feel better. I feel healthier. I don't wake up with hangovers. You know, I'm not, I'm present when I'm with people. I don't forget conversations. It's, it's all the same without the negatives. Yeah. So I was surprised. I, you know, you just do the same stuff. You just don't do it drunk. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like you said, the cooking dinner with the wine, that's something I often hear from people as well. So you said, you know, like when you decided to take the break, you just made that decision and maybe the habit was still kind of oh, it's cooking time. I'm going to have wine. Oh, wait, no, I'm not drinking. So was that like a difficult thing for you to just like resist that urge? Or was it more about just kind of tra transitioning or changing that habit a bit? A, a, a couple of times it was an effort. I wouldn't ever say it was difficult. Um, it was just reminding myself, like I, t I t when I quit smoking, okay, I have all these problems. I quit smoking millions of years ago. I just reframed my idea about myself as a non-smoker. I just mm. said, okay, now I'm a non-smoker. I kind of tried to do the same thing with alcohol. Oh yeah, that's right. I'm a non-drinker. Wow. Um, and make, and the thought would kind of go away. The habit nagging at me would kind of go away. I don't do that anymore. Yeah. And that's a, like, that might seem like a subtle mindset, mindset shift, but I feel like it can make all of the difference because you're just, that reframes everything else that you're Doing. I remember asking myself on the method, I was trying to drink less when I was drinking and I would say, well, what would a normal drinker do right now? And just that simple question, be like, oh, they probably wouldn't drink a bottle of wine on an empty stomach. They'd probably wait for dinner and have a meal with it and pace themselves. And so just that simple little mindfulness exercise really ended up shaping a lot of my behaviors around drinking. Would you find it was like that for you as well? Yeah, then? it is like that. Yeah. Definitely. So you mentioned earlier that you were like a wine drinker. Um, did that change for you throughout the method or did you stick with your kind of favorite wine? What was that like? Wine. Yeah. I'm just 
love that Chardonnay. And so um, I know one of the things advice I would get, well, drink a, uh, drink a kind of wine you don't like or drink a low alcohol wine. I didn't buy one bottle of law. Look, I'd rather not drink than, <laughs> than drink a wine I don't like or drink a low alcohol. So I knew I was going to stick with the stuff I liked and that that would make it more challenging. Um, but, you know, I got through it in the end. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it was Chardonnay drinkers. It's something about white wine. It just makes it so drinkable that even on TSM, I think it's a challenging habit to break because with red wine, you often hear people say, oh, the, it just doesn't taste right. Like I don't like yeah. it anymore, but it didn't do that for me with the white yeah. wine. And so sometimes that's a struggle for people. Yeah. We'll see what happens if I get faced with a tequila. That's a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, down that road. I know it's, it's, uh, so I, so I did try to just stick with wine and not any hard alcohol through the process. Cause I know okay. that's better. Yeah. 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 And something you said earlier that I just wanted to kind of highlight again, is you said that if that like liver issue wouldn't, didn't, wouldn't have come up that maybe you would have just kind of kept chugging along on your TSM journey. So did you want to talk about that? Maybe like what you think would have happened had that scan not have come back with such high uh, liver enzymes? Yeah, I, I, I would have made it work. Um, I probably would, I probably would have um, taken advantage of the um, programs that you guys have. I would have joined more of the video chats. I would have outed myself to more people and let them know what I was doing. Um, I did start doing that. As a matter of fact, I have a few friends that I worry about their level of alcohol consumption. <clears throat> I don't feel like I need to take their inventory, but it concerns me a little bit. So I'd have conversations with them. Hey, I'm trying this thing. It's really cool and see if I could get them interested in it so that I would. And I, the big thing was telling my husband I was doing it going back to the beginning. I probably did it for two months before I told him that I was doing it. I don't know why I was worried. I was worried about judgment, I think. Um, and he was just delighted and, and really supportive, which I was glad about that. So I would have, I would have had to figure out something and I was getting close, to, close to doing some of those things. It's hard for me to join those chats. I don't know why my, it's just, it's just hard. Um, but I was getting to the point where I, this, you know, this is, this is, can't go on this long was sort of where I was getting to. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that join our program in that phase where they've kind of been on it for a while and seen some success, but they can't get over that hump or that plateau. Yeah. So I totally know what you're talking about there. And um, yeah, wow. Okay. So I wanted to ask you because you're retired, I'm just thinking of one of our members. She came to mind when you were talking. Um, she lives in a place where there's drinking is like what the community does as like an activity. She's like, yes, there's people that do alcohol free things, but it's just so much immersed in her environment every day. And she's retired. So she has extra free time. And she's just like struggling with that environmental piece. Like, I think that the protocol is probably working better than she realizes maybe like you kind of experience, but when at noon every day, all your friends are oh, having yeah. drinks, it's like this fight. So did you experience that at all? Or do you have any like thoughts or input on that? I wonder if i could be successful in that environment i my i can imagine that that's really hard for her it would i would have to remove myself i think from that in order to be successful i don't mind now i don't mind going to parties and stuff and everybody's drinking and i don't i i it doesn't feel that different to me although i can observe everybody getting sort of loopy around me but um if it was a daily thing like that and in a community that would be really hard i think I, I was fortunate because most of my friends, what they did was we go to the pickleball court and play pickleball. And that's not something you normally do with alcohol. So um, that may, I think that part of it made it easier for me. I can't imagine how she's, how much of a struggle it's going to be for your other member. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so true. The environment is so, um, I, another person comes to mind where her husband, uh, she was on the method for a while without him and then he joined it with her and that made all the difference because oh, her yeah. person she was with every day was all of a sudden drinking less too. So environment is huge. And, and I, like I was always the one who drank the most. Of you your know? friends group? Of like my family and friends, I, mostly family too, but I would notice that I was the one that had more than anyone else. So now I'm getting, I'm matching up with them more 
it's sort of the opposite of your your other members experience i think i'm getting more like them versus having to to uh fight yeah. that feeling of everybody having cocktails and yeah and not being part of it that's such a good feeling to get that control back yeah. um so I know you said like with where you're at today, you're you're maybe you think you're at extinction, maybe. I know that you mentioned earlier, like you have these fears of going back to where you were, which I think a lot of us do. Um, but just like kind of this feeling that you have or, or what what are the effects that you're noticing to say, like, I think I'm at extinction, like what's changed for you in the last couple of months? Um, I feel like my mental health is better. <clears throat> I feel like my physical health is better. Just just walking around, I feel different. It's, it's, I feel, and I've actually got more of a focus on, on health now because that big unhealthy thing is off to the side. Um, like I said, not, not thinking about it and stuff. Um, and I think it's going to, you know, that's really self-perpetuating. Um, the better, you know, the better I feel, then the longer I'm going to stick with it. Um, I feel like I'm sharper, um, happy to say, I think my pickleball games improved. <laughs> um, so there's just like, so, oh my gosh, I spend so much less money. Every time I went to the grocery store, I bought a, a six pack of wines and I haven't done that in months. Yeah. Um, so there's just, it's like all of those things sort of add up as evidence that, you know, that it's working. Yeah. I do. I do, I do worry. Like I had mentioned to you about, will I go back? And I've even had a couple of people say, you'll go back to the same level of consumption, who which is who not terrible. That? I, I'm not even going <laughs> to. Oh, were they TSM people or no? No, an okay. extended family member. Who, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, yeah. Maybe don't understand <laughs> the results of the method. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but I feel like I've got it. So it, it would be such a, I couldn't, it would be such a disappointment if yeah. I went back. And like I said, I'm too old at this point to put that poison into my body. Mm. You know, you just don't come back that fast in your 60s like you did yeah. when you were 30 and things like that. So I can't just continue to harm my body and my brain. Yeah. Like I did. Yeah. And, you know, take it from me of my personal experience and then all the people I talked to the last five years, you know, if someone, um, you know, if, if you continue to drink and just take naltrexone, beforehand like the results are permanent with the method the the when i see people go back is when they drink without the naltrexone that's guaranteed but i have yet to see that with i have who's seen compliant. so many people post that they thought they had it under control so they stopped taking it i'm not gonna let that happen yeah i can yeah so it's a lifelong thing yeah i had dreams about that happening like recurring <laughs> dreams of drinking without it <laughs> Oh, that's funny. That's a, that's a kind of a typical thing I would do. I have not had that dream. Okay. Maybe you will. Who knows? <laughs> um, okay. So let's see, I'm curious, um, just like a few more questions for you as we wrap up, um, as you actually, like, first I want to understand. So you're obviously so much, feel so much better health wise, mental health, physical health, and all of that. Are you still like thinking about alcohol or mentally preoccupied or craving alcohol or what's that like for you? No. So that's the freedom part. Like that's almost the mental health part. I think for me is my mind is not consumed with all that chatter anymore and all of that thinking or planning or how do I get rid of the bottles? You yeah. know, all the weird stuff. How do I hide this first glass of wine from my husband and make it look like I'm not having one? All that stuff that kept me out of integrity. Um, it's just a freedom. It's just a, I just don't think about that stuff anymore. Yeah. And it just doesn't happen. So it's like a, it's become like a non-issue in your life where you can still go about your daily routine and you're not like, oh, I wish I could be drinking right now. It's just not really an issue for you anymore. Yeah, That's I think I mentioned that I had quit one point for three months. I still thought about the alcohol that three months and it's yeah. different now. I don't. I think that's one of the biggest gifts of this method and something I underestimated when I started on it was how much I was thinking about drinking. And then as I started to not think about it as much on naltrexone, I was like, whoa, I feel like my mind is expanded. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So looking back on your journey, what was, was there anything in particular that was like really challenging for you, if you could say? Um, the challenge, I think the challenging part was, was I not being able to find feeling like I couldn't find that motivation inside me to really 
So I was committed to the naltrexone, but not as committed to stopping. So um, knowing that I was wishing for it to happen like magic, kind of. And I and it might work that way if, if you did it long enough. I knew there was more that I needed to do, and I had a hard time digging that up or committing to that part of it. Um, that made me feel kind of weak and unsuccessful, but I just stuck with it and luck luckily had a bad liver function test. Yes, luckily, the silver lining of that. Yeah. <laughs> So was there like discouragement for you throughout that time or just like genuine feeling of like, is this working? But I mean, clearly you stuck with it, but were you feeling that discouragement? Yeah, I felt discouraged. I, pro I would say probably from month two to month seven, like that section in there in the center, I was feeling pretty discouraged wow. because my, I had plateaued. I was still at three to four drinks a day consistently, not a lot of alcohol free days and feeling discouraged. Yeah, I'm you know, kind of waiting for something to happen to come out of the sky, which is, you know, I like to be a person who's more proactive than that, but yeah. I wasn't being that way. And I think that's really important mm -hmm. that you're speaking to that. And I appreciate you for highlighting that because it's something that so many people go through on the method where it's just like, it's, it's hard to do the habit change piece. It really is the more difficult aspect, especially if drinking has been a part of our daily routine for years or decades. So mm -hmm. if someone's listening right now that can relate with that, you know, just feeling discouraged, see, being compliant, seeing some change, but not really anything major, what would you say to them? Maybe outside of, you know, of them going to get a liver screen, because if their results are good, that's not a very that's powerful not motivator, <laughs> but what, like say that wasn't, you know, your scenario, like what would you advise someone who's in that place? Um, so if, if you're, especially if you were like me, so I felt kind of alone, not like lonely, oh, I'm all alone in this, but it was my struggle. I was the one home alone. I was the one thinking about it all the time. Um, I would say, get in touch with your group, get a counselor. I, I am such a, a proponent of that. And I'm, I'm, it's interesting that I didn't jump right on that. Um, I think that's the, that's the next thing to add to it. If you've been going a long time and you're just starting to realize I've got to do something personally more to make this happen, that would be my advice is, is get somebody to work with you that knows what they're doing, not just a friend. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. Cause we can get so wrapped up in our own thoughts and our own self-talk. And when you conversely have someone that can like reflect back to you, what's going on and kind of shine a light of like, you know, go this path, do this yeah. thing differently. And it's not about uprooting your life. I mean, yours was like a pretty drastic change because it was a serious thing you were dealing with. But for others, I think just even taking small steps in a different direction can really have mm -hmm. big results on the method, but it's kind of hard to get that initial momentum going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So any other like final thoughts or things you want to share with people who are watching this, whether they're brand new to the method or they're just looking into it, or they've been on it for a while, what would you like people to know now that you have your own personal experience of success with it? I, I think I would say um, it works. And I know everybody says that to you, but it works if you trust the process. So if you're even thinking about cutting back on drinking or trying to get control of your drinking, what have you got to lose with this program? It's you take a pill and then you don't have to, you know, you don't have to do much more than that for a while. And I just try it. It works. And then be 100 percent compliant. Don't make it a negotiable. Yeah. And you'll see you'll see the results. Yeah. Well said. And I, I know it, it does work. Like if you give it time and you do it correctly, yeah. it's so powerful. And yeah, the results are truly permanent. It's just incredible to see that change and feel that freedom. That's a word I hear people use all the time. Why doesn't everybody know about this? <laughs> That's a question I hear all the time too. Don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, on our, I'm in California and I'm just about three months ago, I started hearing naltrexone ads on the radio and I was like, yay. Oh, that's you, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Glad to hear it getting more play out here. I know it, it needs more. Um, yeah, it needs more notoriety for sure. It's been around for decades and yeah. people, I have people tell me if there was a medicine that was that effective, everyone would be talking about it. I was like, that's what you think, but they're not. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs>
Well, Tracy, this has been such a great conversation. I want to thank you again for taking time to be with me. Any other final thoughts before we wrap up? Um, no, thanks for having your group thrive. I, I, I've really got a lot, even though I never officially joined up, I got a ton out of um, following uh, Thrive on, on Facebook. And good. keep up the good work, Katie. You're such an inspiration. Oh, thank you. I'm very grateful to do this work. And I'm just, I'm, you know, hearing stories like yours really light me up and just excite me because this method, yeah, it needs more, more people need to know about it because it's yeah. freeing people. I mean, yeah, so happy for you. And thank you so much for chatting with me. Thank you.